together forever. It's Nehemiah chapter 3 and 4. Thanks for joining me today. I'm Jeff Goodson. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and that like button. We begin today with a deep question. Here it is. Ready? Who are you? Who are you? So say you were introducing yourself to someone for the first time, how would you do that? Or when you think about yourself in your private and secret moments, when it's just you alone with yourself and your thoughts, who actually are you? For the men, we often define ourselves using the categories of career and achievements. I'm an astronaut. I'm an actuary. I'm a pilot. I'm a comrades runner. I'm a neurosurgeon. Oh, when you say things like that, people unavoidably look at you with, well, with deep respect. But if you say, well, I work for home affairs, or I dropped out of school, or, I, or I'm a pastor, then, then that same respect won't be present. For the woman, careers are also important, but perhaps more important are our relationships. I am mother to Petunia and to Rocket. I'm wife of Sandile, the astronaut. I'm the daughter of Artaxerxes, the king. Sometimes we define ourselves in national terms. I'm an American, or we're from Australia, the lucky country. Others of us mumble we are South African or Zimbabwean, but by now we're well used to the pity that those comments create. Who actually are you? It's a question that our culture is grappling to answer. We're encouraged to be who you really are. And we're told that you, you must be true to yourself. Of course, that implies that we know who we are in the first place. We're encouraged to go and find ourselves as if somehow some of us got separated and lost from the rest of us. Who? Who are you? Who actually are you? Are you defined by your age? I'm on pension. Are you defined by your sexuality? I'm same-sex attracted. I'm heterosexual or cisgender. Or are we defined by our wealth or our lack of it? Are we defined by our beauty or our ugliness? Are we defined by our ability to hit or kick or throw a ball? Are we defined by our weight or our body shape? By the fact that I'm fat or I'm thin? Are we defined by how many people like us or follow us or befriend us? When you nut it all down, who actually are you? A major Bible book this term is the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And in chapter 3 today, the people in the city of Jerusalem build a wall around that city. That's it. Nehemiah 3 is 32 verses long and it reads a bit like a telephone directory. If you laugh at that comment, then it, it means that you remember a day of telephone directories. I suspect that you're really grateful that you weren't asked to read Nehemiah chapter 3 today. And I suspect that you're also grateful that we aren't going to read all 32 verses in detail. I'm going to summarize them, but we mustn't skip them too quickly. Because they contain a vital truth that will help us in answering the question, who am I? Here's the truth that we are reminded of today. The work of God is a team game. Christianity is a team sport. Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1 says the following. Then Eliashab the high priest rose up with his brothers who built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set up its doors as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. The sons of Hassanah bought the, built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set up its doors, its bolts and its bars. Verse 4, and next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakoz, repaired. And next to them, Meshulum, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshazabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Barna, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. Verse 6, Joeda, the son of Paseah, and Meshulam, the son of Besadiah, repaired the gate of Yeshanah. They laid its beams and set up its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Meronothite, the men of Gibeon and of Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Now, I could carry on reading the rest of the chapter, but I'm, I'm sure by now that you've got the idea already. For 32 verses, we're given a detailed record of people that each build a, a small section of the wall. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that everyone is involved. There are rich and poor that are building. There are priests and Eliashab, the high priest, but, but also ordinary, normal lay people are building too. 
there are men and there are women working together. There, there are groups from different towns and different classes. You've got goldsmiths and perfumers and pretty much every strata of society, all working together, next to one another, together. The phrase that's repeated over and over is next to him, next to them. That's the emphasis. They're all working together, next to one another. They're all in it together. Because, you see, the work of God is done together. Uh, you must grasp that Christianity is a team sport. Uh, we love the rock stars, the, the Christian rock stars. We all have our favorite favorites. Tim Keller, John Piper, Sam Albury, John MacArthur, Alex Begg, Frank Retief, Chris Ramsbottom, you name them. But Nehemiah is teaching us that the work of God, the mission of God, is not primarily done by the rock stars, but rather by an army of unpaid, unheralded heroes working together. People like you. The gospel is spread like wildfire across Africa and Asia, mostly done by ordinary people saying it's too important not to share. I'm going to tell my friends about Jesus. It's done by ordinary people sitting around the braai or, or the dining room table and lovingly talking to their loved ones about Jesus. I love rugby, as do many of you. I'm constantly staggered that those guys can even walk after a game. I seem to get injured when I get out of bed. Now, now one of the unique things about rugby is that it's a game for all shapes and sizes. So you've got teeny weeny little Fuff and, and little Cheslin alongside skyscrapers, Eben and Luit. It's a game that needs those who can kick, like Money and Handre, next to those who can't kick, like Kocha and Sia. There are those who are stocky, like Kitsov and Ox, alongside those who are fleet of foot, like Lucanio and Makazole. Rugby is a, a team game. And it's a team game that needs all sorts of shapes and sizes working together. It's not like basketball where everybody is super tall. It's not like weightlifting where everyone is big. And so too is the work of God. It's a team sport done together by the different and divergent people of God. Now, as you considered your definition of yourself as we began today, did you define yourself as part of a team? You see, do you think of yourself as part of a family? Western cultures view individualism as virtuous, as right, as a supreme value. To be yourself and to assert who you are is courageous and honorable. To look out for yourself is as necessary as the breath that you breathe. Terms such as self-actualization and self-fulfillment are, are now a deep part of the psychological jargon of talk show hosts and self-made philosophers. All of these terms suggest that we define ourselves as individuals who refuse to recognize any constraints imposed by others. Or as Jacko so eloquently sings, I'm an individual, you can't fool me. An individual, you can't fool me. But Christians don't think or operate like that. No, we think we're part of a team, part of a family. Westerners are often astonished that in many African cultures, nobody cares what you do or who the real me is. They care about who's your father. Which family do you belong to? Which clan are you a part of? Which tribe of people are your kin? Here's our truth today. Christians, we're part of a team, part of a family. When you grasp that, then we're on the way to a true definition of ourselves. Christians are defined by the fact that God is our father, that Jesus is our brother, that we belong. We are sons and daughters of God, saved by Jesus together. Last year, the United States Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, not Murphy, released an advisory using the language of crisis and epidemic facing American society. The disease that he was writing about staggeringly was, well, it was loneliness. The report said that approximately half of U.S. adults reported experiencing measurable levels of loneliness, disconnection and isolation. It further said that loneliness is possibly as dangerous for your health as smoking or obesity. The physical health consequences of loneliness include a 29% increased risk of heart disease, a 32% increased risk of stroke, and a 50% increased risk of developing dementia. Staggeringly, lacking social connections, it is estimated, increases risk of premature death by more than 60%. You see, we're simply not made to do life alone. We're made to be in a family, in a team, God's family, God's team, together. So if you find yourself living and defining yourself in categories of the me, the I, the ego, not only is it medically dangerous, but worse, it's just not how it's meant to be. We're meant to do life, church, mission, together, as a team, 
alongside each other, next to each other. You see, I might not have a Muslim friend, but you do. I don't know them like you do. I can and must pray for you when you're speaking with them. Mission is a, it's a team sport. I might have no gifts of speaking about Jesus. I might find that I get tongue-tied and always say the wrong things, but I could make pizza and wash dishes while you speak. I might hate children, but I can clean the Sunday school classroom so that those who do have the gifts to love the children can be freed to use their energy for that. I, I might have no money, but those that do give their money so that others can work full-time for gospel ministry. I might not be able to make tea, but others can bake the most staggeringly delicious delights so that when you invite your friend, they say, I'm coming back just for the biscuits alone. The work of the kingdom of God is done together. Everyone participates. We're all ministers, not just those with PhDs in theology. The work requires all, each and every person, each and every gift. God has drawn you into his church family. You, you, you're not in it by accident. You need it. There, there are certain people that, that only you can speak to. You have certain hands that only you can hold. You have certain hearts that only you can reach. There are certain ways that only you can build the kingdom of God. Your gifts have not been given to anyone else. Everybody does mission. Everybody does mercy because Christianity is a team sport. The problem is often that we don't want the gifts that God has given us. We want the gifts that God has given to others. <laughs> it's a curious phenomenon, isn't it, to me, that the, the rich want others to have the gift of generosity. It's my experience that the poor are often far more generous than the rich. And those with great gifts of music often just don't want to use them for others because they're too busy, too important, too inward, too busy defining themselves in categories that simply don't matter. Nobody writes what they did on their tombstone. Sipo Komalo, accountant. Mary Beth van der Merwe, doctor. Because ultimately it just doesn't matter. What matters is the family to which we belong. God's our father and we are his together. If you're not using your gifts, then you're sinning, so repent. Apologize to God and start to consider why. Perhaps you need to start defining yourself as part of a family. And then don't you be that person in the family. You know, the one that won't do any chores. Nehemiah teaches us that we're a team together. And secondly and finally, remember that if you identify with a team, well, you're going to be despised. Nehemiah chapter 4. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones of that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside them, and he said, yes, what they're building. If a fox goes up on it, he'll break down this stone wall. Hear, O oh our God, for well, we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they're captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So he built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height for the people had a mind to work. Verse 7, But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the wall of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were, were beginning to be closed, well, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and, and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in, in open places, I, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their, their spears and, the, and their bows. It was 14 and I, I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the peoples, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that it was it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan. We all returned to the war, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and 
half held the spears, the shields, the, the bows, and the coats of, uh, coats of mail. So we laboured at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at that time, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by night, and they may labour by day. So neither I, nor my brothers, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard who, who followed me, none of us took off our, off our clothes. Each kept his weapon in his right, at his right hand. I can't imagine that this was a, a terribly fresh-smelling construction site. A day and night they worked together, sword or spear in one hand, bricks and stones and building materials in the other. It's almost guaranteed that, that when you work together for God, that you'll be attacked despised and scorned and even rejected. And this is now the second time that, that we're seeing this in the life of Nehemiah. Christians live aware of the, well, we live aware of the spiritual. We, we live life aware that the physical that we see is not the whole story. There's an eternity far greater than the humdrum reality of our existence. And actually at this present time, there are powers and principalities arrayed against God. They hate God. They don't want the plans of God to succeed. They're actively opposed to the plans of God and the people of God seeking to bring about those plans together. Sambalat and Tobiah actively start to work. They start to speak and agitate against the activities of the people of God. But we're not surprised by this because Jesus has repeatedly warned us of this reality. He said, blessed are you when people hate you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of things against you because great is your reward in heaven. Jesus said, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. The Apostle Paul, he also said it. He said, whoever desires to live a godly life will be persecuted. Identifying with Team Jesus. Well, it won't make you popular. We'll never be cool or in or with it or woke. Our God was stricken. He was crucified. He was despised. He endured great suffering so that we might eternally not be despised. He emptied himself of all his glory and endured persecution by his own creation. And he did it. Well, he did it for his family. There's a sense in which Jesus is saying, look, look, you're going to take a little hit to your reputation. You're going to get persecuted a bit and, and spoken against. And, and, and when that happens, then, then that's a good sign because it means your name is written in heaven. You can endure because you're a citizen, a brother, a sister. You're part of the team. You can't lose because you're mine. So let's hang on together. Notice, Notice how they handle the persecution and the suffering. It's no surprise. We handle it together. Nehemiah doesn't retreat. He mobilizes them. They take sensible precautions and they, they get on with the task together. They pray. They pray hard. They stick together. And they get on with the job. Nehemiah prayed and he set guards. They, they took their spears and their swords to work with them. They set up a watch system and they built the wall. But most importantly, they encouraged each other to to keep on going together. Because the work of God, well, it's a team sport. If you love defining yourself as an individual, you'll live in a small universe, leaving a small impact. You'll make a small contribution to the family and you'll not reflect the likeness of Christ. But if we stick together, if we pray, if we remember that we're in a team, if we act as if we're in a team, just think what an impact your life can have for eternity. Now there, something to talk about over your next meal. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you that life is done next to each other. We thank you that our sin has not left us alone, that you have placed us in a body, your body, together, forever, family, with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.